challenge for us to maybe be willing to be a little bit more real, not so much a mask. I know these are real concerns and needs that we have for uh, family members and loved ones, prayer concerns. Bill Phillips, if you remember Bill, he is at Mount Carmel uh, ICU, lung disease. We appreciate it if you remember Bill Phillips and his illness. And this is for Wes. So the 12 month old patient girl, Eve Marcus, has heard, heard from her from a missionary friend a water accident, water in her lungs, and fear of infection. So remember little Wes, she's a 12 month old uh, little girl in Haiti. And we want to remember Evelyn Woolard and also her mother, uh, Louise Ray. Evelyn is out of the hospital and she's doing much better. And, and Louise is progressing well and out of ICU, but uh, both very much appreciate the prayers and continue to remember them. They're both uh, battling cancer and chemotherapy, etc. Uh, keep the Barrett's in prayer. They're going to be traveling later this week through the following week. And safe travels for Addison, uh, Allison's son, coming home from Florida this week. We appreciate your prayers for him. And also uh, for the friends, the family of Emily Stewart, a uh, friend of Missy. She passed away Thursday the 24th, so please remember the family of Emily Stewart. So those are the updates and the additions, if you can add those uh, to your list. Appreciate your prayers for our efforts yesterday. We did um, reach a good portion of the village, and you go out on the table, we'll talk about it when we leave. The yellow pages out there have our Summary already of uh, there's probably 35 or 40 different prayer requests that we have already with what's already been returned. So we appreciate your uh, willingness to partner with us and keep those folks in prayer uh, from our canvas efforts yesterday. So let's just take a few moments and pray personally and silently, and then I'll close. Yet again, our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your intervention in our lives, for your willingness to walk with us another day, uh, to go with us into another week, to provide and protect, to prepare. Father, we know that you renew us, you give us strength and courage, wisdom and grace. We are thankful that you uh, are willing to begin with us again pray that we can always draw near to your word, to rely upon, to internalize, to know, to trust uh, your teaching. We pray that we will be quick to recall it, to share your message with the world around us when they question, uh, when they're wondering and confused. We pray that we can continue to be enriched in your teaching, your truth. Thank you for all of those who share each week in meditations and lessons and worship and praise. Father, we thank you for opportunities to reach out to our community and the world. We pray for those that have been willing to share their hurts, uh, their needs, and their blessings with us. And we, we pray that we can remember uh, to bring them before your throne of grace. We pray that you will continue to inspire and strengthen us each day. It's in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, that we pray. Amen. As we, as we begin the sermon portion of the service today, I want to start the message by showing you a video clip up here. My, this might possibly be the most moving commercial, essentially a Powerade commercial, that I've ever seen. So we'll try to start with this clip of this little fellow named Nico. <coughs>
know. <laughs> that's, that's a little kid that was born with one leg. And you got me, maybe you've seen him in the soccer games. He grows up to be a powerful soccer player. And I'm, I'm just reading what I hear. Do seeing clips like this make you stop and think? <laughs> Do struggles like Nico's give you a healthy dose of perspective? Do struggles like the preacher up here in those <laughs> give you a healthy dose of It happens to all of us. You know? And, and, and the, the thing is, this kid goes through all these stages of life and is just missing entirely from here down. And he plays ball and he makes great shots and he grows up, he's probably, I think, about 20 now. And and I wanted to see that because I can't compare. I can sit here and try to fuss about not being able to show video clips, but it doesn't compare. You know? And some people are going to be able to say, yeah, I know what that's like. I know what it's like to battle. But for some of us, I wanted you to watch something, somebody really struggling, and then say, all right, whatever you've been whining about this week, does it all of a sudden uh, not quite so bad? Sometimes it's good for us to be reminded. And I wanted to remind everybody before we finish this sermon about the early Christians. They, they had their struggles. And you probably know that, but I just wanted to make that statement in case you think, we've talked about these Christians all month, and then, you know, I think they had all this success because everything always went their way. You know? And that, that's just not true. Okay? And Michael Green wrote this in chapter 13, 30 years of change the world. And he wrote about their hardships. And he contended that the hardships and the pressures that the early Christians faced came from five different sources in the first century. And we're going to consider a couple of these. Uh, they're not all going to be on the screen, but we're going to consider a couple of them that are overarching. And the two sources that are always in play are Satan and self. You want to try them? Yeah. See if he shows up. That looks good. I spoiled it for you. Because if, if, 
you read through the book of Acts this month, the devil is working in the book of Acts, okay? Satan is working against the people of God. If we were in chapter 8, Simon, the sorcerer, would be confusing people with his magic. His sorcery that the people there say, well, this is the power. This is the divine power. And it's not God. It's the devil blinding people's hearts and minds. We go down through chapter 13, and Elimus, another sorcerer, gets a little more than he bargained for, shall we say, because he tries to oppose the message, and Paul calls him out, calls him a child of the devil, and he is physically, literally blinded for a time. In chapter 16, when that slave girl was set free, possessed her. Chapter 19, these guys, the seven sons of Sceva, and they're trying to attempt an exorcism without being in touch with Jesus, and they unleash a hornet's nest of a beating on themselves. All of those are examples of how the devil was moving and working and blinding and confusing people in the first century. He is still doing the same thing today, and yes, we encountered some of that opposition yesterday in the village. If you want to ask, I'll tell you the story later. These are hardships. They're troubles. Why am I struggling? And part of your answer might be this. <laughs> because the devil wants you to. Satan has picked you out like he picked out Job. You're talking. And God is always able. God can renew. God can strengthen and protect just like he did Job. But that's obviously not without pain. And sometimes great cost. Satan has always been trying to drag God's people down. Uh, misery loves company. This is why we pray, we study, we put on the armor every day because this is spiritual warfare. And part of the hardships are the devil is out there battling every day. That's one that's included in everything we talk about. And the other one that's kind of overarching is self. Somebody asked one golfer, What's your handicap? <laughs> Myself. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. You and I can be our own greatest handicap. And America's real good at playing the blame game. It is somebody else's fault. It is the system's fault. It is the government's fault. And in truth, sometimes it's just me. It's my fault. And how does Paul warn the Ephesian elders? They're on the beach in chapter 20, verse 28. And he tells those guys before he leaves them, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock. Be shepherds. Be on your guard. And repeatedly in the Bible it says, Take heed, take heed, take heed. Take care of yourself. Watch yourself. Remember a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we had the hurdles up here on stage. Things that hinder our prayers. And we said one of those is willful defiance. It's me. It's me saying, no, God, I'm going to continue to hide this habit, even though I know you know everything about it. I'm going to continue to not acknowledge, keep making this choice, even though I know it's sinful. And then we turn around and say, why do I face so many hardships? So those two are always in play, Satan and myself. It's a battle every day until I die. That's why I suit up, put on the armor, the praying, the reading, the accountability, those are daily contributors to the hardships that we face. And what I want to do with the blanks on your outline is address a couple other more outward, more visible hardships. And some of our hardships come about as a result of our circumstances. So I know it's kind of small, small print, but circumstances and look at those. No fault when all of those people are facing hardships because of their circumstances. And Michael Green quoted a man, F. K. Maltby. He said, Jesus promised his disciples three things. They would be absurdly happy, completely fearless, and in constant trouble. And Michael Green said, that's a pretty fair summary of the first Christians. And I wanted to ask, does that look like a pretty fair summary of your past couple of months? And it's okay to say on, on those three statements, no, that's not me. Because I know, I know some of the stories in the room. And I know the struggles. And there are some things that I'm sure I know that are equally difficult. 
So I fully understand if somebody were to go out in the foyer after the service and say, no, those three statements, no, that's not me. Hey, well, the last part's me. In constant trouble? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> I'm in constant trouble. But no, I don't feel absurdly happy. No, I'm not completely fearless. <coughs> would, would you be? If you were facing what I'm facing, those are the circumstances that come about in our lives. Um, losing a job, battling an illness, weathering the storms. That those are circumstances. And, and if you've read through the book of Acts by now this month, I hope you notice that they face some hardships that come through nothing else. than It's the circumstances that face them every day. Paul appeals to Caesar. He says, I want to be tried in Rome, and the powers that be, fine. We'll put you on a boat toward that end. And how does that work out for Paul and all of his crew's companions? It's a disaster, literally. It is a storm, two weeks, 14 days being driven along by a hurricane force wind. And, and I just want to stop for a minute and think about that. I want to try to put that in perspective. We still have hurricanes, okay? And, and they are still bad. I mean, we get these maps, and this one in particular, because when a storm threatens Norfolk, the fleet is sent to sea, and they send out these carriers. I think that's a Harry S. Truth. I think that's the actual picture I got. These carriers that displace or weigh a hundred and I got the number, a hundred and ten thousand tons. So do that math. How much they weigh? One hundred ten thousand tons. They have nuclear power. That ship can steam three million miles without ever having to be refueled, and they will run away from hurricanes. Imagine riding out that kind of storm in a big old wooden sailboat with 276 seasick people down below. The early Christians had their storms. They did. And they faced diseases. Secretary like was talking about diseases that we still face. Paul goes through that shipwreck, slogs up on shore, wet, cold, shivering mess, is introduced to Publius who turns around and says, this is my dad, can you do anything? He has a fever and dysentery. They face diseases. And, and don't forget the prisons. The chains. And Michael Green called them constraining circumstances. And, and somebody said, what was prison for Paul can be little children for a mother. I've got to hear this out, what, what, the, what this means. Okay? No, nobody's saying that the mother doesn't want to have the children. We all know some women who have been nothing short of amazing in the way that they raise the kids and the giving and the nurturing, and the kids are blessed beyond measure. The mom wants every bit of this. I get that. But what we're saying is, it's a sacrifice. It can be confining. The writing said, when you have little ones around, mom doesn't always get to do what mom wants to do. And some moms go, what do you mean always? Never gets to do what she wants to do. And I, I thought about Sarah White. She's got a heart monitor that she's got to wear for 30 days. You know, get, there's a family. You guys got, there's some that are going into high school, going to middle, in elementary school, and Austin's going to kindergarten, and then you strap on a heart monitor with all the wires, and she said it's very constraining. <laughs> it's confining 24-7 for 30 days. You know, and what I don't want us to do, what nobody in the room can afford to do, is develop this, oh, pity poor me, nobody has it as bad as I do mentality. Whether it be these confining conditions, or diseases, or disasters, you face them, I face them, we all face them. Christians throughout the history have been facing them. They're not punishments. The text says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. That's Matthew 5, 45. That's why I appreciate Brian putting that video up there of, of little Nico. What, what was that little guy's attitude toward missing one leg? Or, or the video with the kids, you know, throwing away the masks. You know, and the question of the song, Mandisa song, what, it was, what if we were real? Some of those clips, it's, Nico wasn't always smiling. Sometimes he cried. Sometimes he was angry. We don't always have to face the circumstances with a smile, but we're always going to face them with the Savior. And Paul is preaching Jesus in the hold of that ship, and these people are listening to him because their circumstances are pretty crappy. 
Because we went back to Acts 2.47, and you always read that verse that says, the Christians enjoyed the favor of all the people. And if you were here the first week of the month, we had a picture of Nero using Christians as human torches. You say, some of them, no. No, it wasn't all the time. Not all the Christians. But even in the midst of their hardships, when they suffered unfairly through their, unfairly through their circumstances, mm -hmm. the silver lining, if, if there's anything, the silver lining was... People did support them. And they cheered for, they admired their endurance and what they put up with. Now, that's still true. People, people cheer for the oppressed underdog. I remember about, it was about a month ago when Miss Paltrow, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, had headlines when she said, Moms who work nine to five have it easier. And this is her quote I feel like it's much harder for me. And you read that, you let that sink in. It's like, who do you think is going to feel sorry for the megastar who thinks that she has a rough? But the little, us little nine to five underdogs, people cheer for us. When we make it through the circumstances. And sometimes make it through means victory, and it's a healing, it's a miracle, you know, overcoming the circumstances. I don't know if you cheered this week for this little guy, Willie Myrick. Remember, did you see this story? Willie is a nine-year-old who was kidnapped, I think in Atlanta, and the kidnapper drove him around in a car for three hours, but then just opened the door and kicked him out. So just get out. Because this little guy right here, for three hours, repeatedly sang the same gospel song. Every praise. <laughs> this is actually the chorus. God my Savior, God my Healer, God my Deliverer. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. Every praise is to our God. And he just kept singing, singing, singing. God might say, just get out. <laughs> and sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's a powerful deliverance, like Willie's. Sometimes it's not. You know, sometimes it's just endurance. Sometimes it's just making it through a tough time of patience. Sometimes it's just barely tears. But in every circumstance, that comes our way. We have opportunities to trust God. And the other one is that sometimes we face hardships due to this secular society. We have our movie stars and our politicians who are always berating our stance via abortion and gay marriage. We have the ACLU and others who are constantly trying, somebody's going to try to stomp out prayer at graduation in the next couple of months, I'm sure. They're always trying to evict the the commandments from the courthouse lawn. Just remember that the first century Christians, they had their demonstrations, they had their riots too. Uh, look at what unfolds in chapter 16. Acts 16 in verse 18, Paul releases this possessed slave girl and you would think that's a good thing. right? You would think, well, wrong. Okay. If we read what unfolds, Verse 18, 19. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone. Here it goes. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authority. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. So here's Paul and Silas spending the night, bruised and bleeding. And, and not to mention the fact that we always go on from there. We talk about how they sang hymns and praises and the earthquake and the victory and the salvation. We're not even getting that far right now. The, the point is, you would think... One good turn deserves another. <laughs> Releasing that slave girl is a good thing, but they get anything but that. The owners are irate because it's about the money, and they're losing money. The crowd joins in the attack. And we read, I tried to pause, but we read these sentences about people being beaten and flogged. It's kind of matter-of-factly, we just go right on. I, I wish I could illustrate that as graphic. That's the opposition that these people face for preaching Jesus. So you want to go back and talk again about any opposition that we thought we
we faced yesterday, going door to door and visiting people in the village. And I talked to, to most of the people who took the routes. I didn't hear of anything terribly threatening. The most I got was one or two people back away going, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> I hardly call that opposition. And over in chapter 19, there's another riot. This time it's in Ephesus. It's the same start. You know, verse 29, the whole city is in an uproar. The people are packed into the theater. Everybody's screaming. Verse 32, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. I thought, that sounds like modern-day America. Some people don't even know what's going on. Oh, well, somebody's got to protest, so let's protest. There's a demonstration. Let's scream and yell. And sometimes we read the, the book, especially Paul, and you get the sense that, that Paul just wants to take everybody on. You know, if there's a riot in the theater, he's just going to rush in there headlong and, and start wailing, and such is not always the case with the Christians. Okay? Well, when the persecution breaks out in chapter 8, the Christians leave. They flee. They leave the city, and they go somewhere else. Now, they're still telling the story. They're still preaching about Jesus, but they left the danger situation and went to some place where there's some more friendly confines. And how many cases are there where Paul and company are either asked or challenged or almost forced to get out of Dodge? Leave the town for your own well-being. You know, and I'm not saying in this sermon at all that we ought to just stay where we are in the face of threats and danger. You know, if you're clearly not being effective at the moment, you want to move on. And here's a phrase we'll put up, uh, chapter 14, verse 28. Look at that part of the verse. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. And where is there? There, at that point, is Antioch. And this is a picture of the Mediterranean coast. It may not be exactly Antioch because Antioch is in the coast, but that's pretty close. And I'd kind of like to go there. <laughs> I think I could stay there a long time. <laughs> because Antioch was a strong church. It's a protective environment. And they went to a good, safe haven, and they spent a long time recovering and recuperating. These early Christian people are not indestructible. They're bold. But they're not flawless. And I, I'm even encouraged by the, the actions of Paul in chapter 23, beginning with the first verse, 23.1. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, You dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I do not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. And we can argue that this Ananias guy isn't the most deserving holder of a position. But Paul is apologetic. And he's, he can be bold, and he can be loud, but he can also be provoked. And this guy pushed him, and he's caught off guard, and he throws something back, and he's very quick to say, I'm sorry, and he'll move on. Now, I, I know it's not easy to be a Christian in 21st century America, and it's getting tougher every day. And there have been, and there will be times when we are facing pressures from a very secular society and sometimes we need to make mistakes and apologize. Move on. Is there any silver lining in that? You can argue, well, Paul makes a mistake. Paul has to apologize. But he's still given an opportunity to speak before the Sanhedrin. These guys are not going to darken the doors of his church. But he gets to share with them. It's just like chapter 7. Stephen is opposed, but he has an opportunity to speak about Jesus. And if you're familiar with Stephen's message in chapter 7, at the end of the message, he makes this statement that inflames and enrages his audience. In verse 51, this is what he says. This is how he read it. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And I think I've always read it that way because that's the way it's punctuated and the idea's got those exclamation points. <clears throat> and the next verse says, they're angry, and they gnashed their teeth at him. So I assumed, 
that Stephen is no doubt angry and yelling. And I was reminded this week that may not be the case at all. Denise and the ladies studied this exact text in the Thursday morning study. And she said, you know what, what if, what if, instead of being all belligerent, defiant, what, what if Stephen is just heartbroken? He's in tears. And he's sad that they, they can't get it. That is the attitude that sometimes I need to have. That's the mindset that I need to have in the face of the vitriol and the anger and the animosity. It's sadness. That's not anger. I'm sorry and I'm sad that you can't get this. Wednesday, this fellow, Stone Cold Steve Austin, came out in support of gay marriage. And you can see by the background there, he is a former wrestler, and he has that loud, obnoxious sort of presence. What also chaps my expletive, some of these churches have the high horse that they get on and say, we as a church do not believe in that. Which one of these quote-unquote people talked to God, and God said that same-sex marriage was a no-can-do? I thought, well, all of us. <laughs> it's, it's written right down. So, and I thought about that. If I go and scream and rant and rave in the face of Stone Cold Steve Austin, is that going to get me anywhere? The hospital? <laughs> <laughs> but if I go with sincerity and sadness, there's a lot of wisdom in society. There's a lot of intelligence in society. And they create hardships. And I'm most likely not going to berate some of these people into the faith. But if I can, with sincerity and quietness and even sadness, say, I'm just sorry, this doesn't make sense to you. The early Christians faced many of the exact same hardships that we face today. And I believe that they faced them with grace and class. And they knew when it was necessary to draw the line, hold the line, keep the position, and stand the ground. And they also knew when it was time to move on. And I don't think any of these people are relished the argument. I don't think anybody came home and said, oh, honey, had a good day. <laughs> Ticked off nine people today. Got in three fist fights. Bloody one up. Persecuted for the faith. No, I think they faced the hardship the circumstances, the society, even the internal church issues, which we didn't have time to go into today, that's a whole other sermon, they faced those hardships with grace and class. And they were mindful every day. They knew every day Satan was playing a role and the sinful self factored in every hardship, every struggle. Our, our world is not unlike theirs. They, they face the same hardships that we do, the same challenges. But we're reminded that in the course of 30 years, they changed the world. And I tried to do that math. If the Lord so tarries and waits, 30 years from now, it'll be what, 2044? And I will be 77. And what will I have done to change the world for Christ? And don't give me that, oh, I'm not going to be here in 30 years. Though. What will you do? with the number of years that you have. Let's pray as we close. Father, I thank you for your strength. I thank you for the courage and conviction of Christians, um, first and 21st century believers, people who withstand uh, the force of a society that can be very secular, people that are willing to cling tightly to your truth in the midst of circumstances that are beyond our control. Father, we pray that we will each and every morning put on the full armor of God, that we will look to your word and your truth to sustain us and direct us. We know every day Satan tries to tear us down. We can sometimes be our own worst enemy. But Father, as we face the hardships, may we also do that with grace, with class, with the mercy and the strength that comes from you, our loving Lord and Savior. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. And we continue, we continue to extend an invitation. You might be hearing that for the first time. You might be hearing that for the thousandth time. But nevertheless, it is important. It is vital that you consider your decision. And if you
know that you need to give your life to the Lord this morning, uh, we challenge you to come to the front. Let's stand together and we'll sing uh, our invitation again. <laughs> see white ones, that means they're new, and we'll just go back and forth from white to yellow. White. So please help us with that portion. Uh, this is the next step to pray for people. To my knowledge, we're, we're open, mostly. Um, if they didn't have a lot to share, they weren't defensive, they weren't angry. So we appreciate all your prayers to present that. I don't know of anybody having any dangerous events. Nothing was made weird to me. I appreciate all your help. So uh, again, we believe that prayer is powerful. I'm going to ask Stephen if he'd be willing to close us with prayer, please. Thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, God. Thank you for your person here. God, as, as we go out from here, uh, we know that the opposition that we may face is real and has power. God, but we pray that we go in confidence, knowing that uh, you have full power and you are bigger than all this. God, we pray that uh, you consume us with your spirit, uh, that we uh, are, are strong in you. God, we love you and thank you so much. 
as we take the exit out of the uh, service today, our closing hymn will be number 815, Doxology.